Welcome to the module on stereo fundamentals. And in all of these modules about stereo, what we're doing is engaging more closely with our capacity to hear space in the sounds that we hear. And when we're talking about stereo, we're, we're really engaging most closely with our capacity to hear where things come from. Now, our ability to hear where things come from is the result of our brain and our body responding to different cues that occur in the environment. One that we discussed earlier in the module on spectrum and filters is the fact that the pinnae, our outer ears, are actually directionally sensitive filters. You can demonstrate this um, for yourself by closing, using your hand to close off one ear as much as possible and then listen to some sounds around you. And you'll notice that you can still tell, for the most part, where they come from. What your brain and your body is doing is it's using the information provided by this cue. It's noticing differences in the spectrum that arrives at that single ear using what it's learned about that information in the past to give you some sense of where a sound comes from. Another cue that we use is visual information. Visual information can be combined with auditory information to produce a perception of location. An example of this that will be familiar to many of us is our perception of the location of voice sounds in film or television. Almost regardless of where the speaker, the loudspeaker, is located in, for example, a cinema, we will tend to hear a voice sound as if it's located where we see that character moving their lips. Visual information, in this sense, has the potential to override the information that arrives at our ears or to override information that we might otherwise know about where loudspeakers are, about where sound sources are actually physically located in a given situation. However, it's the difference in signals that arrive at each of two ears that is probably the most influential cue that the, our brain and body uses to determine the apparent location of a sound source. And what we'll see in a little bit more detail in a second is that this difference in what arrives at each of our two ears can actually be broken down into two separate cues, interaural level difference, or ILD, and interaural time difference, or ITD. So let's talk about interaural level difference, first of all. When a sound is on axis, in other words, when it's centered with respect to, our, to two ears, it has the same distance to travel to each ear. So imagine that this fluff ball over here is a sound source, and this is a listener, and this is their two ears. We draw a line from that sound source, that centered sound source, to both ears, and we can see that these lines are both the same length. There's the same distance to both ears when the sound source is centered with respect to the ears. And since it travels the same distance, the level of that signal will be attenuated or reduced by the same amount as it arrives at each ear. We know that as sound signals travel through space, they're attenuated. But these two sound signals, both originating from the, sounds, the same sound source, will be attenuated by the same amount as they arrive at each ear. So they'll arrive with the same level. But if we have another sound source and it's off axis, like this one over here, then we can see that the geometry changes. It'll be further from one ear than it is from another. And as a result of that increase in distance to one ear, it'll be attenuated or reduced more as it arrives at the ear which is further away. And this is interaural level difference, or ILD. Moreover, the inverse square law that talks about how sound is attenuated as it travels uh, a distance through, through space and through the air, it tells us that sound level is reduced by roughly six decibels for each doubling of the distance. And this means, if you think about it a little bit, 
that this ILDQ is going to be more impactful when sound sources are close to the head. When we're very, very far away from a sound source, the interaural level differences are not going to be very significant because the distance from one ear to, to another, which is the maximum difference in distance we could have for a path from a sound source to our ears, is going to be very small in proportion to the overall distance. So the levels are going to be very are going to be very similar to each other in both ears. But when a sound source is close to us, then the difference in distances in the distance that the sound has to travel to reach either of our ears is going to make a big difference to the apparent level at each of those ears. So interaural level difference is one of the important cues in the physical sense, physical situation, and it's one that's most impactful when sounds are relatively close to us. So let's move to talk about the other cue, interaural time difference, or ITD. When a sound is on axis, so centered with respect to our two ears, again, it has the same distance to travel to each ear. And since it travels the same distance, it takes the same time to travel to each ear, and thus arrives at the same time. But if a sound is off axis, then it's further from one of the ears, as we saw before, and this means that it will arrive later at the further ear. In this connection, we should note that the speed of sound is 344 meters per second at 20 degrees Celsius and sea level. This, is a, this can be a useful figure to remember in thinking about the acoustics of different situations. So given those figures, it takes sound about 0 0.0005 seconds, a half millisecond, to travel 18 centimeters, the approximate width of a human head. So if we had a sound source that was directly to our left, the energy from that sound source might arrive a half millisecond later at the right ear than it did at the left ear. So we're talking about very small differences of time, but our auditory perception system has evolved over an incredibly long period of time, the, 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 the time of life on Earth, uh, in order to be able to use these differences to evolutionary advantage. After all, if you can tell precisely where something is in relation to you by sound, uh, and it's something that might eat you, knowing exactly where it's coming from could be the difference between life and death. So as a result of this long evolutionary process, we have been able to use these two cues, interaural level difference and interaural time difference, to form a very, very precise perception of where things appearing to uh, appear to come from. A final note about interaural time difference before moving on, the impact of this cue is not directly impacted by distance, unlike the interaural level difference cues. If imagine a sound is all the way on our, precisely exactly on our left here, it doesn't matter how far away it is, the time difference that it takes for that signal to get from this ear to the other ear is gonna be the same because that distance, the distance between our two ears has stayed the same. So we use these two cues to form our perceptions of the space of sound together with some other cues like we saw. So how can we make recordings that contain these cues, aka stereo signals, and, and thus recordings that take advantage of our highly evolved sense of the space of sounds? There's a bunch of different ways that we're going to talk about in this section of the course. So one method is panning, and that's where we take a mono signal and we distribute it between left and right channels in proportion to a panning position. This is commonly built into digital audio workstations, and probably many of you watching this video will have experimented with this technique already. Another technique, in some ways related to panning, but quite different, is the technique of pseudo-stereo. And that's about taking a mono signal and giving it spatial cues by generating multiple channels using different time delays and filters, etc. We'll talk about that uh, a little bit later in another video module. A third important technique is the technique of stereo recording, which is where we use two microphones to record different signals from the same situation. 
This is a very important technique also, and we will talk about it in another video module. And finally, there are also stereo manipulations. These are processing techniques where we take existing stereo signals and we transform them in various ways that increase or decrease or scramble the spatial cues in those existing stereo recordings. So we have these four different ways of making stereo signals and they're all useful in different times and places. So let's consider a little bit some of the general issues or challenges that we might encounter when evaluating stereo signals or when trying to make them, trying to use them in projects. So one very broad and general issue is the issue of realism. In other words, what kind of perceptions of position and movement do we get when we use specific techniques with specific types of signals? This is a complex area. Uh, it's not possible to say that a given technique is simply realistic or not realistic, but we do have some kind of rules of thumb, some kind of heuristics about what seems to be more realistic or less realistic or, or realistic in a particular way. I think the, the important thing to keep in mind when considering the realism of stereo signals is that there's no, there's no such thing, there's no such single thing as, as a realism where what you have is simply a copy of the world. We're always dealing, when we're dealing with audio technologies, with, with representations and reflections and certain kinds of copies of the world that are not the same, never the same as what they were copied. So I think the question of realism is not so much a question of what's realistic versus not realistic, even if we sometimes talk that way. It's more a question of focusing our attention on, on the specific nature of the representations we get and the perceptions that we get. In what way is a particular signal or recording realistic? That's the question. Um, somewhat more, less complicatedly, more concretely, an issue we might encounter is the difference between headphone playback and loudspeaker playback. Stereo signals involve having a left signal and a right signal that are different than each other. Now, when we listen to that with headphones, we're listening to those two signals very directly. Our left ear is getting, is getting the left signal and our right ear is getting the right signal. When we play that back in a room with loudspeakers, it's not so straightforward. In that situation, the left signal is arriving at both of our ears, although it's traveling over a different path to get there. And the right signal is also arriving at both of our ears and traveling over a different path to get there. So things that sound a particular way with headphones may not sound the same way when we listen to them on loudspeakers in a room. And similarly, when we take stereo signals and we play them with different configurations of loudspeakers, very close together, very far apart, pointed different ways, that will also impact the kinds of perceptions we get from these stereo signals. And a final very general issue that we'll encounter talking about stereo techniques is the issue of mono compatibility. What happens when we take our stereo signals and we down mix them to mono by mixing together the left and right signals and having just one signal again? When we do this, it's possible for things that are opposite in the two signals to cancel each other out and for particular sound sources to, to disappear or be reduced in volume, reduced in their apparent loudness. And at the same time, it's also possible for some things to get louder if they add together in a particular way when we mix those two signals together. So if we care about mono, we need to make sure that we're also listening to our stereo signals in this mono way so that we know what happens when someone listens to them in mono. It used to be that this was very important because there were so many mono playback devices in the world. AM radio, you know, car radios, television for a very long time only had a single channel of playback. It was mono playback. Um, so for example, with movies, with cinema, uh, this was very important because it was very common for a long period for cinemas to have very detailed sound systems, stereo or even more than stereo, but then home movies would be played back on televisions that only had mono. And so the soundtrack component of that film had to work both in stereo for the cinema environment and in mono for the home environment. Nowadays, 
it's not as important as it used to be. Stereo devices have become much, much, much more ubiquitous than they used to be. But there are still situations where people listen in mono. Um, for example, someone listening to something from a, a telephone without, from, a, from a smartphone without headphones is going to get, um, probably, probably, depending on the smartphone, going to be listening in mono. And when we listen um, to something directly out of a, a computer, a set of computer speakers, there might technically be two speakers there, but they might be so close together that really what we hear is something kind of like a mono signal. So this issue of mono compatibility has become less severe than it used to be, but it's still something that we might need and, and want to think about. So as a summary of this first module, we saw that the brain and the body uses multiple cues to determine the spatial location of sound sources. And we saw that the difference between the signal received by the right and the left ears is a very strong cue for spatial details. It breaks down into interaural level difference, which is differences in the level received by each ear caused by different distances of travel from the source to each ear, and also interaural time difference, which is differences in the time of arrival at each ear caused by different distances of travel from the source to each ear. And we have different strategies for making recordings that contain these cues. And we saw that some general issues we're gonna pay attention to are realism, the impact of different playback situations on our stereo signals, and mono compatibility. Thanks for listening and talk to you soon.